Okay, let's go, ladies and gentlemen. We are continuing Act 3, Scene 1, and this is a really important part. Anthony had just come back to speak to the murderers, the conspirators, um, and we are getting... Actually, technically, he hasn't come there yet. Remember, he sent his servant very wisely. He knew that at that point, they jet, that you know, they would have jumped and they would have killed him at that point. Or he may not have stopped himself from going after them at that point. It's an interesting... I don't know, but I think seven on one probably would have been bad for Anthony. So he sent the servant, said, would you you know, guarantee his safety if he comes and he hears out your reasons why? Um, and that's... Remember, Brutus is Mr. Honor. Um, and the servant actually pointed that out. He said, my master reminded me to tell you that you're Mr. Honor and he wants to know if you'll you know, keep him safe. And he said, yes, he will. And that's where we're going to pick it up right now. Anthony is coming to speak to the men who just murdered Caesar. Now, importantly, pay attention to how Anthony acts. Now, Brutus said, unbelievably so, at the, last end, the end of our last you know, our reading, I think we'll have him well to friends to Cassius. And Cassius is like, dude, I don't think so. I don't, I don't like him. I don't trust him. I think it's a bad idea. I don't think this is good. Um, and that's where we left off. Uh, so Brutus actually thinks this guy is going to come and be like, hey, dude, what's up? How you doing? Thanks for killing my best friend. Good job. Um, it's, in fact, quite the opposite. Watch how Anthony enters the scene. So, in fact, here we go. Enter Anthony. Now, this is scene one continued, act three, and we're at line 163. Um, and Brutus says, hey, here comes Anthony. Welcome, Mark Anthony. And rather than coming over and saying, Brutus, my boy, my man, giving him a hug, you know, pound him up, what's up? No, Anthony goes over to his dead friend and he says, almighty Caesar, dost thou lie so low? Are all thy conquests, glories, triumphs, spoils shrunk to this little measure? Fare thee well. Now, ladies and gentlemen, he turns around and he talks to the murderers. And he says, I know not, gentlemen, what you intend. Who else must be let blood? Who else is rank? If I myself, there is no hour so fit as Caesar's death's hour, nor no instrument of half that worth as those your swords made rich with the most noble blood of all this world. I do beseech you, if you bear me hard, now, whilst your purpled hands do reek and smoke, fulfill your pleasure live a thousand years. I shall not find myself so apt to die. No place will please me so. No means of death as here by Caesar and by you cut off the choice and master spirits of this age. So he said, you know what, guys, if you're going to kill me, kill me now. All right. While you're sitting there literally smoking and reeking from the blood of Caesar. Because remember, these gentlemen have dipped their arms and hands and swords and knives in Caesar's blood. So they're covered in it. And Brutus says, oh, Anthony, and by the way, Anthony doesn't want to be killed right now. He knows Brutus won't do such a thing. So he's actually kind of reverse psychologying him, getting Anthony, Brutus to say, no, of course we're not going to kill you. Listen, oh, Anthony, but not your death of us. Though now we must appear most bloody and cruel, as by our hands and this our present act, you see we do, yet you see but our hands. And this the bleeding business they have done. Our hearts you see not. They are pitiful. And pity to the general wrong of Rome. As fire drives out fire, so pity, pity, hath done this deed on Caesar. For your part, to you our swords have leaden points, Mark Antony. Our arms and strength of malice and our hearts of brother's temper do receive you with all kinds love, good thoughts, and reverence. Oh. Brutus says, we love you, dude. Cassius, he's a little bit more manipulative and devious. He says, your voice shall be as strong as any man's in the disposing of new dignities. So Cassius knows telling him he loves him isn't going to do anything. He's trying to work on Antony's greed and saying, your voice shall be as strong as any man's in the disposing of new dignities. So when we're giving out new jobs, because we're going to be the big boys, the Caesar's done, we'll hook you up, Anthony. We'll make you strong and high. Um, here's the point, though. Anthony already is high up and already is strong. He doesn't need these guys' help. But listen, Brutus says, only be patient till we have appears, appeased the multitude besides themselves with fear. And then we will deliver you the cause why I, that did love Caesar when I struck him, have thus proceeded. So Brutus says, we will tell you what happened. But first, let me go talk to the people because they're freaking out. And Anthony says, I doubt not of your wisdom. Let each man render me his bloody hand. So check this out. This is so awesome. Anthony is devious and he's smart. 
He says, all right, all right, let me shake all your hands, okay? And then you can come and tell me. But notice what he does when he shakes their hands. And by the way, when he shakes their hand, he's shaking all that blood, Caesar's blood, with each and every shake. But watch what he does. He says, first, Marcus Brutus, will I shake with you? Next, Caius Cassius, do I take your hand now, Decius Brutus, yours now, yours, Metellus, yours, Senna, and my valiant Casca, yours. Though last, not least in love, yours, good Trebonius. Gentlemen all, alas, what shall I say? Now notice, not only does he shake all their bloody hands, he names them all one by one. And listen, the last one, he said, though last, not least in love, yours, good Trebonius. Now, why does he save Trebonius for last? Remember, Trebonius is the one who took Anthony away so that Anthony wouldn't be there while they killed Caesar. It was there, you know, they had, they, they had, figured this out before and this was part of their plan. Trebonius' job was to lead Anthony away, right? So Anthony knows that. And Anthony was going to get Trebonius last. So why did he name all them? I think Anthony was just naming his death list. I think he was locking into his mind every person he's going to come after. Listen, my credit now slants on such slippery ground that one of two bad ways you must conceive me. Either a coward or a flatterer. But now this is interesting. To them, wow, you guys must think I'm a punk or a coward, right? Because here I am shaking the hands of the guys who just killed my best friend. That mm. I did love thee, Caesar. Oh, tis true. If then thy spirit look upon us now, shall it not grieve thee dearer than thy death to see that? Oh, hold on. He's not, oh, snap. He's not talking to the guys that he just shook their hands. He's talking to dead Caesar and he's going, I'm sorry, Caesar, that you had to see me shake these guys' hands. So if you're Anthony, I'm sorry, if you're Cassius or Brutus and you see Anthony apologizing to Caesar, what does this tell you? This guy's never gonna be your friend. Listen, if then thy spirit look upon us now, shall it not grieve thee dearer than thy death to see thy Anthony making his peace, shaking the bloody fingers of thy foes most noble in the presence of your corpse? So he's apologizing to Caesar. He's like, I'm sorry you have to see me shake these guys' hands, Caesar. I'm sorry you had to see it. It would become me better than to close in terms of friendship with thine enemies. Pardon me, Julius. Here what thou bade, brave heart. Here didst thou fall. And here thy hunter stand signed in thy spoil and crimsoned in thy lathe. A world. That was the forest to this heart. And this indeed, O world, the heart of thee. How like a deer struck by many princes dost thou here lie? So he's going on and on and on and on to Caesar about how terrible these guys are who just killed him. And Cassie says, Mark Anthony. Because Mark Anthony's showing his true heart. When he looks at the guys, he can, you know, shake their hands and, you know, I think he's lying to them, manipulate them. But once he sees Caesar, he breaks down and says, dude, I'm so sorry, I can't do it. And what does that tell you if you're Cassius? This guy is never going to be on your side. I think Cassius knows it. Brutus will never see it. Brutus only hopes for the best. Listen, Anthony, pardon me, Caius Cassius. The enemies of Caesar shall say this, and in a friend, it is cold modesty. Cassius says, I blame you not for praising Caesar so. But what compact mean you to have with us? Will you be pricked in number of our friends or shall we on and not depend on you? So Cassius goes right to it. He goes, all right, Anthony, I accept your apology. But what do you want from us? All right. Are you going to be one of us or are you against us? And Anthony says, therefore, I took your hands, but was indeed swayed from the point by looking down on Caesar. Friends, am I with you all and I love you all upon this hope that you shall give me reasons why and wherein Caesar was dangerous. So he says, all right, <coughs> I'll be your boys. I'll be on your side, but you have to tell me what was wrong with Caesar. And Brutus says, or else this was a savage spectacle. Our reasons are so full of good regard that were you, Anthony, the son of Caesar, you should be satisfied. So he says, Brutus says, don't worry. Our reasons are so good that if you were Caesar's son, you'd be like, thanks for killing my dad. And Anthony says, that's all I seek. And then moreover, suitor that I may produce his body to the marketplace and in the pulpit as becomes a friend, speak in the order of his funeral. Okay. Did you listen to what Anthony just asked? Because this is the crux of it all. If Brutus says no to this, the play probably ends, but he allows Anthony this request. Listen, that's all I seek and am moreover suitor that I may produce his body at the marketplace and in the pulpit as becomes a friend, speak in the order of his funeral. So he says, I would also like to show the body to the people of Rome. And I'd like to speak at his funeral. And Brutus says, you shall mark Anthony. 
And Cassius right away says, Brutus, a word with you. Come over here. Now, why is it a bad idea to let Anthony speak at Caesar's funeral? Because Anthony can go up there and talk about how these guys just murdered Caesar. And let's go get them. And Cassius pulls Brutus aside. Remember, an aside to Brutus means only Cassius is only speaking to Brutus. We hear it as the audience, but Anthony does not hear this, right? He's whispering in his ear, right? Cassius says, oh, I lost my spot. Hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Here it is. Cassius says, you will not let me do. Do not consent that Anthony speaks in his funeral. Know you how much the people may be moved by that which he will utter? And Cassius like, what are you, crazy? You can't let Anthony speak at his funeral. He's going to get the people against us. And Brutus says aside to Cassius, by your pardon, I will myself go into the pulpit first and show the reason of our Caesar's death. What Anthony shall speak, I will protest. He speaks by leaving by permission. And that we are contented, Caesar shall have all true rites and lawful ceremonies. It shall advantage us more than do us wrong. And Brutus says, no, no, I'll, I'll talk first. I'll get before the people and I'll say, this is why we did what we did. And then I'll tell the people. The only reason why Anthony is speaking is because we're letting him and he's just here to speak good about Caesar. He's not allowed to speak bad about us. And Cassius says to Brutus, I know not what may fall. I, I like it not. He says, I don't know what's going to happen. This is a bad idea. And by the way, Cassius is right. Now, interestingly enough, before they killed Caesar, they had to let Brutus do what he wanted, right? Because they had to have Brutus in the plot, right? So that the people didn't kill them. But they've already killed Caesar. Why does he listen to Brutus now? He doesn't have to. He can say, no, dude, we're not letting him talk. But Cassius allows this to happen. Listen, Brutus, Mark Anthony, here, take Caesar's body. You shall not in your funeral speech blame us, but speak all good you can devise of Caesar and say you do it by our permission. All right, so Anthony has a deal. You can speak at the funeral, but you can't talk bad about us. Now, guys and gals, is there a way that you can talk bad about somebody without actually saying bad things about them? And the answer is yes, sarcasm. Ready? Ask me. Like, let's say my, my wife made, and she's a crappy cook, and she knows it's a terrible cook. Let's say she makes dinner for me, and somebody said, hey, Mr. Kenny or Andy, how was that dinner? And my wife is sitting there, and I don't want to say, oh, God, it was awful. I might say, oh, it was really good. <laughs> it was so good, let me tell you. Now, my wife would know instantly because she knows her cooking is terrible. I mean, she eats it too. She knows it's terrible. But she would hear my sarcasm and everybody would know by the way I said it that what I was really saying was her food was bad. It was really bad. So sarcasm is something that you can do. But Brutus isn't taking that into account. Let's listen. Okay. Mark Anthony, take Caesar's body. You shall not in your funeral speech blame us, but speak all again, all good you can devise of Caesar and say you do it by our permission. Else you shall not have any hand at all about his funeral. And you shall speak in the same pulpit where to I'm going after my speech is ended. By the way, he's saying, I'm going to talk first and then you talk second. Guys, who has the more power in an argument? The person who speaks first or the person who speaks second? If other people are listening, the answer is the second person has so much more power. Why? Because they can refute everything the first person said. They can go, well, he just said this. I'll tell you why it's wrong. Boom, 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 boom. The first person can't get up again and speak in that hand. So if it's one and two, the two has the, 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 the more advantage. So Brutus should speak second. But again, he's speaking first. Another mistake. Anthony, be it so. I do desire no more. Anthony's like, of course. I don't, I don't even know if Anthony thought that they were even going to give him to this. This is too much. Brutus. Prepare them the body then and follow us. Okay, all but Anthony exit. All right, so check it out. Anthony is alone on the stage right now. All right. Well, technically, the dead Julius Caesar is on the ground still. But Anthony's alone. All the other characters have left. All the other living characters have left. So we're about to hear a soliloquy by Anthony. We're about to hear his true thoughts. Now, what do you think Anthony is going to say to his dead friend now that everybody is gone? You think he's going to say to his dead friend, all right, sorry about everything, but I'm going to go make a deal with these guys? Oh, no, no, no. He's going to say the exact opposite. It's actually kind of unbelievably wild what he's about to say. He's about to say things like, dude, I'm going to kill them all. I'm going to destroy this city. Listen to what he's about to say. Anthony's angry. Listen. Oh, pardon me, thou bleeding piece of earth, that I am meek and gentle with these butchers. So now he's apologizing to the dead Caesar. 
Thou art the ruins of the noblest man that ever lived in the tide of times. He's like, dude, I'm so sorry you had to see me shake their hands, but I did it because I had to. But don't worry, dude, I'm going to get them all. In fact, listen, thou art the, the ruins of the noblest man that ever lived in the tide of times. Woe to the hands that shed your costly blood over your wounds. Now do I prophesy, which like dumb mouths do open their ruby lips to beg the voice and utterance of my tongue. A curse shall light upon the limbs of men. Domestic fury and fierce civil strife shall cumber all parts of Italy. Blood and destruction shall be so in use and dreadful objects so familiar that mother shall but smile when they behold their infants quartered with the hands of war. All pity choked with custom of fell deeds and Caesar's spirit ranging for revenge with Ate by his side come hot from hell shall in these confines with the monarch's voice cry havoc and let slip the dogs of war. At this foul deed shall smell above the earth with carrion men groaning for burial. Okay. Um, yeah, Anthony's going to bring the pain to these guys and to everybody else. If you cheered for these guys, you're going down too. I think Anthony's about to go kill all Pompey's guys, actually. That's what's about to happen. He's going to kill so many men right now. And the irony is, why, by the way, did they kill Caesar? Why did Brutus kill Caesar, right? Because he might become a king. And what do kings and dictators do? They kill a lot of people that they don't like. Was Caesar doing that? No. But Anthony's about to start doing that. So the irony is they killed Caesar to prevent a tyrant. And look at Anthony. Watch what happens. Oh, by the way, enter Octavius' servant. By the way, you may or may not know this, but Julius Caesar had a nephew named Octavius. And Octavius coincidentally happens to be outside Rome right now with an army. And guess who Octavius is going to side with? Is it going to be Anthony or is it going to be Brutus and Cassius, the guy who just killed his uncle? Oh, it's going to be Anthony. So if you're Anthony, not only do you have your army, well, guess what? You've got Octavius Caesar's army has just rolled in. Listen, you serve Octavius Caesar, do you not? Servant, I do, Mark Anthony. Caesar did right for him to come to Rome. He did receive his letters and it's coming. And bid me say farewell by word of mouth. Oh, Caesar. See, the servant didn't even know that Caesar was dead. He just showed up in town. He's like, yeah, Caesar asked us to show up. And he's like, oh, snap. Caesar's dead on the ground. And Anthony says, thy heart is big. Get thee apart and weep. Passion I see is catching. For mine eyes, seeing those beads of sorrow stand in nine, begin to water. Is your master coming? Servant says he lies tonight within seven leagues of Rome. That's like five or six miles outside of Rome. This is perfect timing for Anthony. He says, post back with speed and tell him what hath chanced. Here is a morning Rome, a dangerous Rome. No Rome of safety for Octavius yet. Hi, Henson, tell him so. Yet stay a while. Thou shalt not back till I have borne this corpse into the marketplace. There shall I try in my oration how the people take the cruel issue of these bloody men. According to thou which shalt discourse to young Octavius of the state of things, lend me your hand. And they exit carrying Caesar's body. So Caesar said, okay, I'm sorry. Anthony said to Octavius's servant, come and help me. Let me go talk to the people of Rome. And then afterwards, go and tell Octavius what happens. Now we know what's about to happen, ladies and gentlemen. The next scene, my favorite scene of this play, it's the speeches. First, Brutus is going to get in front of the people and he's going to explain to the people why they killed Caesar. And the people, can I tell you, they're going to cheer. They're going to say it's Brutus. It must be for the good of Rome. And they're going to be like... Good job. Thank you. He should have killed Caesar. He was a bad dude, blah, blah, blah. Brutus is going to convince them. It would have all ended there if Brutus had said no to Anthony. But here's the problem. Anthony is going to get up and he's going to flip it all around. And by the time Anthony is done with his speech, <laughs> the people are not going to be on Brutus' side anymore. So we will check that out when we get here tomorrow. Everybody have a really great day. Great job.